Hey folks, welcome to Thinking Theology. I'm Don. If you're new here, I don't take a dogmatic stance on things. I look at things more philosophically. I do have a pretty deep uh, theological background, but I look at things more philosophically in the sense that if something makes sense, I go with it. If it doesn't make sense, I don't. Atheists make sense on a lot of things. Atheists don't make sense. Religionists make sense on some things. Religionists don't. So I just take a look at the arguments. I've seen some of Kenneth Copeland's stuff in years past when I was more actively involved in Christian theology. And I'm going to revisit one of the things that I can tell you that I personally detest is the prosperity gospel. So just on practical grounds, on what I see and experience in life, as well as if you're going to use the texts as the, the biblical tes- texts, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament as the basis of what you believe, then you want a certain measure of consistency. And consistency in any realm of life, whether it's literary interpretation, biblical interpretation, or whether you're going out to buy a car, you want to be consistent in your line of thinking. If you're going out to, if you had just had your third child and you're going out to buy an SUV, you wouldn't go to a Ferrari dealership to look at two seaters. That's an that doesn't make sense, is what we say, but there's an inconsistency there. So without that said, I mean I think we all pretty much know that. I'm gonna take a look at Kenneth Copeland and just see what he's been doing more lately. I think this is from 2002, and just see what some of his uh, arguments are, if you will, on behalf of the prosperity gospel. Now, open your Bibles to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. I'm going to show you something now that the Lord showed me quite some time ago. All right. I got to stop already. When you say the Lord showed you something, it's one of those things that makes it impossible to gainsay, to speak against. I can't say the Lord didn't tell you something. I can't say God didn't tell you something. I can't say any spiritual being didn't say something to you. I can simply say it doesn't make sense to me. I know I actually used to say that decades ago. Because the group I was with, it was a common expression. And so if you got an idea that was sort of outside the box in some way, you say, the the Lord put it on my heart or God put it on my heart to give you a call or whatever. Now, nobody's going to say, no, he didn't. They, you, can't, you can't. It's one of those things you can't disprove it. And so people rely very heavily upon statements that cannot be disproved. So in this case, The Lord showed him something. The Lord told him something. He entered into a covenant that the Lord told him. It's like, okay, maybe the Lord did do that. I just don't trust those statements. I wish people would rely more heavily upon, I got the idea. I studied this. I looked into it. What have you. It shall come to pass, if you'll hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all of his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set, set thee high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake you, if you'll hearken or listen to the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed, blessed. Look at the eighth verse. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses or barns and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself. He has sworn unto thee if you shall keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways." And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. They shall be afraid of you. Why? Because you're wealthy, and God is making you wealthy, and they hated, the devil hated that. All right, there's a lot to unfold here. First, Deuteronomy is Moses's writing, right? The first five books, Pentateuch. This is written to a certain people at a certain time. Israel, then certain conditions based on other things going on in the world. 
Now, what Kenneth and what Copeland and a lot of ministers will do this is they'll take something that is written to, in this case, to a nation, a, a certain group of people, and say, that applies to me now individually. So you're going from a large a corpus to like a large body to me now. And so it's really just co-opting something that you may want to hear. Oh yeah, I want wealth. But another thing that's a big problem is that why will the nations fear you? Why will they fear you? Oh, you're going to be wealthy. Well, if God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, all right, and I'm just saying, I don't believe these texts. I don't disbelieve these texts. My position is if you're going to base your religion or theology and interpretation upon these texts, then you've got to be consistent. God has not given you the spirit of fear. So why would he say, you know, if you're wealthy, people are going to be afraid of you? One, that doesn't even make sense. I know a lot of wealthy people. I'm not afraid of them. I'm actually very encouraged by a lot of them because the, many of them are philanthropic. They're very kind, thoughtful, giving, generous people. I don't fear that. So that line of reasoning doesn't make sense. The fear that was being spoken of here is that if Israel unites and coalesces as a people and walks in the commandments, which, my new Christians today don't walk in because they view the commandments as a curse. They Many do, that they see it as their no, the law is a curse, which talk to an Orthodox Jew and you'll find out, no, it's a blessing. We know what the parameters are, how to stay in God's graces, and so forth. So they'll fear them if they become powerful as a nation. They will maybe not attack you. I mean, look at what's going on today in the Middle East. I mean. You can extrapolate out and say maybe these principles apply still to this day in that regard. But as far as you becoming wealthy individually and then sort of reveling in the notion that other people will fear you, that to me just doesn't make sense. If God is love, let's say, why do you want to become something that other people will fear? That to me doesn't compute. Anyway, let's see what else he's got to say. So, now then, prosperity was God's idea from the beginning. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. With long life, he will satisfy you and show you his salvation. Well, I went after that in a huge way when, when I entered covenant with Jesus to live to be 120 years old. And so then I had a lot of business to take care of. And so I began to speak to my hair. It started turning gray. Well, I went to him about this and I said, I, I don't care. It's scriptural to, to become gray headed. But you said you're doing this because of the word of faith. It's not just scriptural, my friend. It's in scripture because it was natural. It, it preceded the texts. The, the text didn't, once the texts arrive, you know, the mosaic, the prophets, minor pop, that isn't when gray hair arrived. Gray hair was already in the world at that time, and this was just, a, the writings just reflected that. So I'm going to talk to my hair. Yeah. I started talking to it, and it, it started becoming gray all around. And I said, no, 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 I'm not having that. No, 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 no. Stand there in the, in the mirror and look at it and say, gray hair, bye. <laughs> and it's gone. It's gone. I said, I, it, it's up to you. If you want a bald-headed preacher, okay. You want a white-haired preacher, okay. But we're doing this on the word of faith. All right. First, there's contradiction here. He chose a number of 120. He wanted to live to 120. All right. Now, one, that's an arbitrary number. Why not 400? Why ever die if it's completely up to us? to regenerate our cells in our body. Here he's talking about 
the hair coloring, you know, the follicles need to be in good shape and other parts of your body need to supply the, the coloring to the hair. I said, but whatever's there needs to be ongoing. He chose 120 and then he went after the hair. But yet, 30 years ago when I watched Kenneth Copeland, he looked a lot younger. The skin cells were different. The muscle tissue underneath were different. The bones were different. All of the physical parts of him were different. So the notion that we would have to, one, identify every part that we want in order to make it to 120 in decent shape, there's a contradiction there because we're still going to die. Even if he lived to 120, we'd still have to die. And therein, the decay in the human body would continue, whether it's gray hair or osteoporosis or the musculature or the eyesight or hearing, there would be decay. So entering into a covenant, well, whose covenant was it? Then you can answer, well, did Jesus come to you and say, I want you to believe to be 120? Okay, I'll believe that. Well, if I'd heard a voice that I was convinced of that said that, I probably would. Or I would at least consider doing it, but then I'd say, well, am I crazy? Like, did I hear that in a dream? Like, what, what is that? But the notion that he set a number at 120 instead of forever actually is a self-defeating number because it still says the basic premise is I'm going to die. And with that is decay, whether it's your gray hair or not. But I don't know if you've heard of the the uh, mad scientist with the brain and the vat argument that how do, and this is a philosophical, it's just a thought experiment, literally and figuratively in ways, where it's on the nature of existence. How do I know that I'm not a brain in a vat somewhere and that some scientist somewhere, not earthbound, but maybe some deity is just pushing all the right levers, has the right computer program or whatever such a deity would have, and just infusing me with sensory perception such that I believe that I'm in a studio making a recording and that you know my family and my friends and my football team and all these different parts of my life that I've got were not just being pumped into me through like st some kind of stimulation, electric stimulation or whatever, and then I'm not just a brain in a vat and I think all these things are happening and I feel things, but it's because some evil scientist or deity or, or even benevolent one, I don't know, is controlling it. And, you know, Descartes, I think, therefore, I am. At least he's saying something is doing the thinking. Whether there's some other thing putting the stimulus into my brain, something is doing the thinking and therefore I am. Now, there are arguments that have evolved uh, since then, of course, that have said, well, that's not really a good argument, but it's, it's, a decent, it's a decent argument for existence. Something is thinking or talking right now. But what Copeland is talking about here, and a lot of believers, this line of thinking that if you believe something, it will come to be, that makes you, not that the outside is putting stimulus into you and controlling you and what you're thinking. It's saying, I basically become God because I can control things that are happening out there or things that would happen naturally even in my hair as long as I just think it and I believe it, whatever that looks like. I mean, make your fist harder or something when you believe. Like, how do you believe more to get to the point where you can control those things that happen naturally? But that 120 number, even if he, Kenneth Copeland said, that's the number I want, okay, fair enough. You could say, I want that. And then I prayed about it, and we're going to see if it happens. But he's saying he entered into a covenant as though this external being, Jesus and what he said, said, you need to live to 100. You need to believe this. Okay, I can't say he never had that conversation. I can simply say it doesn't make sense to me. All right, let's go go a little further. I didn't hear anything. I said, you hear what I said? So I kept, I kept going at him over that. And he said, well, yeah. He said, I don't have to answer that. You know what to do. Use your mouth. <laughs> Put your faith on that hair. I did it tonight in the hotel room. 
stand there and look at it, and I said, Harry, you oh, are boy. good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. I found a hairspray that didn't have any alcohol in it. It's manufactured right there close to my, our house. Amen. Amen. Because this is my testimony. <laughs> and the and the reason. Now, if you only require, here's the question I have simply, and maybe there's an answer for it. If you only require belief or faith or talking to your hair, why the hairspray, non-alcoholic hairspray? Why? The, the, the flat physical is a side issue here. And... I know Brother Roberts got where well, he got before he got through, his, his legs wouldn't hold him up. So he would have to preach in a chair. Well, I just went before the Lord and I said, I'm not going in a chair. I'll work out just as hard as I possibly can. And I will preach standing up with, and I'll do it with a full head of hair. All right, I'm going to end there because, firstly, he just said something too. All right, so whoever Brother Roberts is, obviously the pe the people knew who he was who were there. And the people who are there go there because they love Kenneth Copeland or his teachings or like them or enjoy them or get or edified by them and such. So fair enough. But this gentleman, Brother Roberts, his legs gave out on him, so he preached from a chair. And Copeland said, I'm not having that. So he went to the gym. Now, there's an inconsistency with what he said. Because one, he's saying his hair changed because he believed it. He spoke to it in the mirror and said, whatever, probably in the name of Jesus, I command you to not be gray or stop being gray. So why not do that with your legs? Why go to the gym? Why put in that effort when you could continue preaching or to whatever else you might do? And that's the thing. Now, this gentleman, Brother Roberts, uh, preached from his chair, I guess he didn't have the faith Kenneth had. Is that what Kenneth is trying to sort of uh, allude to or sort of add behind the scenes in this surreptitiously to say, hey, look at me, I've got great faith, but atheists work out. Buddhists work out. People work their bodies, and it's a simple principle. If you use your body, work your body a certain way, yes, you will be stronger, and your legs will last longer and better. But the refuge here generally is if something goes wrong and it's going to go wrong in Kenneth Copeland's life and his body. I mean, even he didn't admit it, but he, he said it. He wants to live to 120. So there's going to come a time where he ceases to exist in his physical body. I mean, whatever, if he's 80 years old now, he's got another 40 years. In any case, that time is coming. But if something goes wrong in the meantime, uh, other than the natural aging process that clearly he's undergoing, as am I, as we all are. Generally, the refuge in that is, well, I just didn't believe enough. So you've got to get some kind of quotient of believing that changes the whole dynamic of your body and death. And there's something that the theologian, the religionist, in this case Christian, has to account for, to, in my estimation, in a much better way. And the use of the text, applying those from the Hebrew Bible, where Moses is basically speaking to Israel, and Israel wasn't then what it is now. Um, you know, geographies change, locations change, people uh, in ways change. But he was addressing Israel, and Kenneth Copeland is using that to say, well, if you buy by the laws, if you do these rules in a certain way, which there'll be a logic to that, then you'll be much better off. You'll do well. You'll be prosperous. And guess what? You'll be fortified. You'll be unified. And other people can't come against you. They'll be afraid of you. They won't come after you as readily as they might if you weren't unified, for example. You'll be less vulnerable. Okay? Specific context to a specific people. To come out of that and say, you too can use that principle and be prosperous and your hair won't turn gray that just to me is a quite a bit of an overreach so anyway leave your comments folks
I don't have a problem if people have faith whatsoever. I don't have a problem if they don't. If people are nice, I like them. If they're not, if they're not nice, I don't really care for them that much. I don't, I don't like that. You can believe what you want. Just don't be a jackass about it and act, whatever. All right, guys, leave your comments if you made it this far. Have a great day. I'll see you on another video and keep thinking theology.